Hello and welcome to Vodcast 12.3. In this vodcast, I will overview adiabatic heating and cooling, as well as atmospheric stability. As mentioned in a previous vodcast, when condensation occurs in our atmosphere, it can produce one of three things, dew, fog, and clouds. For that condensation to occur, we must cool the air to and below its dew point temperature. Now, the formation of fog and dew doesn't seem too difficult to comprehend, because as long as the air near the surface gets below the dew point temperature, we can form fog and dew. But clouds, which form very high above the surface, utilize a different mechanism for formation. Let me introduce the concept of adiabatic temperature changes. An adiabatic temperature change is going to be heating or cooling that occurs without heat energy being added or subtracted to the system. You might have real-world familiarity with adiabatic cooling if you've ever used spray deodorant or hairspray. To explain, inside of a spray deodorant can, the contents are under extremely high pressure. But when you spray the deodorant and the contents leave the can, they can rapidly expand. And when they do so, they'll experience a significant decrease in pressure, and that's what makes spray deodorant feel very cold when it hits your skin. It feels cold because the contents were allowed to expand, thus decreasing their pressure, and with that decrease in pressure, adiabatic cooling occurred. I'd like to start by referencing the two things you see in red. Specifically, rising air will expand and descending air will be compressed. The reason that that occurs is because as you go higher into our atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure will decrease. For our considerations, we're gonna talk a lot about parcels of air. To keep things as simple as possible, you can almost imagine that parcel of air is just being a little bubble of air with an imaginary lining containing its contents. So if an air parcel rises vertically up into our atmosphere, it will expand and cool because the atmospheric pressure will be decreasing with increasing altitude. On the other side of the coin, if a parcel of air is descending, meaning that it's moving towards Earth's surface, it will warm as it approaches Earth's surface because the atmospheric pressure will increase as you approach ground level. There are two adiabatic rates that we have to know going forward. The first of which is known as the dry adiabatic rate and the second of which is known as the wet adiabatic rate. When we're concerned with the dry adiabatic rate, we're talking about unsaturated air. More specifically, it's air that has not reached the dew point temperature. For the dry adiabatic rate, the temperature of rising air will drop 10 degrees Celsius for every 1,000 meters that it rises vertically. Now the other adiabatic rate that we have to consider is the wet adiabatic rate. And the wet adiabatic rate will come into play once we've reached the condensation level in the atmosphere. The condensation level can occur at different altitudes, but it will always occur at the dew point temperature. So in this image, at a height of 3,000 meters, we've reached the condensation level, and as air rises above that 3,000 meter mark, the wet adiabatic rate is what we have to consider for the cooling rate of that air. Now one thing that's very important to notice is that the wet adiabatic rate is different than the dry adiabatic rate. For the wet adiabatic rate, the temperature of the rising air will drop more slowly. And that's because latent heat is being released by water vapor as it condensates above the condensation level. So for the wet adiabatic rate, rising air will drop by 5 degrees Celsius for every 1,000 meters. And for the dry adiabatic rate, rising air will drop by 10 degrees Celsius for every 1,000 meters. But there's one more take home point that I'd really like to stress on this slide. And that is that cloud formation begins at the condensation level. In order for water vapor to condense and form clouds, a parcel of air must be cooled to and then below its dew point temperature. And one other technical point that I'd like to stress on this slide is that the wet adiabatic rate can range from 5 degrees Celsius to 9 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters when we're considering rising air and adiabatic cooling. I'd like to now transition this discussion to atmospheric stability. Before talking about atmospheric stability and instability, we need to know what the environmental lapse rate is. The environmental lapse rate is how temperature above a parcel of air will change with height. Now the environmental lapse rate can change on a regular basis for a given location. But if we focus in on the image to the left, we see that the environmental lapse rate drops five degrees Celsius for every 1000 meters of altitude. Now that we know what the environmental lapse rate is, I'd like to talk about atmospheric stability. And the picture that we're currently looking at is a great example of atmospheric stability. We know that the dry adiabatic rate for a parcel of air is 10 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. But if the environmental lapse rate is 5 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters, let's compare the environmental lapse rate to the dry adiabatic rate at different altitudes. Now, at ground level, they're both 25 degrees Celsius, so they have the same temperature. 
but at an altitude of 1,000 meters. The environment is now 20 degrees Celsius. Its temperature drops by 5 degrees Celsius, as it should, but our rising parcel of air now has a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius because the dry adiabatic rate requires that it drops 10 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. Now here's another very important concept. If a parcel of air is cooler than its surroundings, it will have a higher density than the surroundings. And if that parcel of air has a higher density than its surroundings, its tendency is going to be to sink. So with stable air, our parcel of air will resist vertical displacement. Let's take a look at the image on the right side of this slide. It highlights the exact same concepts as I just described, but it's important to know that in the next vodcast, we will talk about some processes that force air upwards. Now in this image of absolute stability, that parcel of air is not going to want to work its way upward vertically into our atmosphere on its own, because the environmental lapse rate is only 5 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. And that environmental lapse rate is smaller than both the dry adiabatic rate and the wet adiabatic rate for a rising parcel of air. But if that air gets forced upward by other means, say frontal wedging or convergence, you'll often see the formation of widespread clouds with very little vertical thickness. If there's precipitation associated with these types of clouds, it will be light or moderate. And for those of you that are mathematically inclined, I'd like to turn your attention to the graph you see at the far right side of this slide. To keep this conversation as simple as possible, I would first start by noticing that the purple line, which represents the temperature of the environment, is to the right of the line showing the dry adiabatic rate and the wet adiabatic rate for our rising parcel of air. Anytime that's the case, we are looking at a graphical representation of atmospheric stability. Our final consideration for this vodcast is atmospheric instability. Now with instability, the air will act like a hot air balloon. And there's an image I want you to focus on on the right hand side of this slide because it's a very important conceptual reinforcement. A hot air balloon will rise because the warm air inside of the balloon is less dense than the surrounding air. And with that warm air being less dense, its tendency will be to rise upward. Well, as long as air is warmer than its surroundings, it will rise. And it will do so according to the exact same concepts that explain why hot air balloons rise. With absolute instability, it's very important that you know that air will not resist vertical displacement. With absolute instability, the air will rise, and it will continue to rise until it reaches a region that has its same temperature. As that parcel of air rises, it will undergo adiabatic cooling, and the clouds that form from atmospheric instability can be towering. In fact, it's absolute instability that produces some of those powerful thunderstorms that we observe. Let's take a look at the image in the middle of this slide. In this particular situation, the environmental lapse rate is 12 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. And that environmental lapse rate is a pretty significant temperature change per given change in altitude. So let's start off by looking at the surface, which is 40 degrees Celsius, and that is extremely hot. Solar energy will warm the surface, and that can actually trigger the rising of a parcel of air. I'd just like to state once more that the dry adiabatic rate for a rising parcel of air undergoing adiabatic cooling will be 10 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. So if we now focus in on the 1,000 meter mark, our rising parcel of air has cooled from 40 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius. But based on our environmental lapse rate, the temperature of the surroundings will only be 28 degrees Celsius. So knowing that our parcel of air is warmer than the surrounding air, our parcel of air will continue to rise and cool adiabatically. Now let's move up to 2,000 meters. Our rising parcel of air is now 20 degrees Celsius, and the 2,000 meter mark would represent the condensation level because that's the level at which the dew point temperature is reached. At the condensation level, the temperature of the environment is 16 degrees Celsius, and what that means is the rising air is 4 degrees warmer than the environment, so it will continue to move upward. And as we continue to move to higher and higher altitudes, we see the formation of a very towering cloud. In fact, this could be the formation of a cumulonimbus cloud with a very large anvil head on it that eventually becomes a severe thunderstorm. Okay, that concludes this video podcast. In our next vodcast, I will overview four different processes that can lift air.